Good evening, everybody. I'm Kirk Watson, and I'm the founding dean of the Hobby School of Public Affairs at the University of Houston. A uh, few of you are joining us, and as you join us, I want to uh, say a few things about uh, what we're doing here tonight. Um, the, we're doing the Hobby School in conjunction with the, the University of Houston Center for Public History uh, is, is celebrating and uh, going to have this event to talk about uh, the book, The Governor and the Colonel, which is a dual biography of Governor William P. Hobby and Ovita Culp Hobby, written by Don Carlton. And we have Don Carlton here with us tonight, uh, and, I, and I'm going to get to ask him some questions about that. Part of the reason we're doing it this month is we're doing it to as part of Women's History Month. And in just a few minutes, as we talk about uh, this amazing uh, Texas power couple, you'll see why uh, it, it, it plays a significant role in Women's History Month. I also want to start by saying that uh, every day, the Hobby School of Public Affairs celebrates the Hobby family. Uh, we work pretty hard to honor them and to make them proud of the work that's going on at the Hobby School. And we're proud tonight that family members, hobby family members are joining us. Uh, I know that we're being joined tonight by Lieutenant Governor Bill Hobby, uh, Laura Hobby Beckworth, Paul Hobby, and Kate Hobby Gibson. Um, it's only fitting and proper that uh, they're with us here tonight. We have the chance to say thank you to them for uh, all they mean to the hobby school and to Houston and the state of Texas as a general rule and the role that they have played in Texas's history uh, as we uh, talk about um, Governor Hobby, uh, Governor Will Hobby, and Ovita Cope Hobby. With that, what I'm gonna do is uh, introduce the man of the hour, and that is Dr. Don Carlton. Uh, Dr. Carlton, Don, is a friend of mine and uh, is somebody who is a real treasure in, in terms of Texas history and the role that he is playing in Texas history and making sure that we don't forget our history. Uh, Dr. Carlton is the executive director of the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History and the J.R. Parton Chair in the Archives of American History at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of 12 books, including Red Scare, A Breed So Rare, Struggle for Justice, and Conversations with Cronkite. Uh, Don's also the executive producer of two PBS documentaries, one in 2010 called When I Rise, and one in 2016 called Cactus Jack, Lone Star on Capitol Hill. Uh, prior to the creation of the Briscoe Center, uh, Dr. Carlton served as the founding director of the Houston Metropolitan Research Center where he was the founding editor of the Houston Review. Um, we're, we're really pleased to have him because he is a proud alum of the University of Houston, uh, having received three degrees, including his PhD um, uh, at the University of Houston, and he earned his doctorate uh, with a, in US history. He was a, an early student, I'll also mention, of uh, a beloved uh, hobby faculty member, Dr. Richard Murray. Um, so uh, we're, we're very pleased to have you. And Don, thank you for, for doing this tonight. Um, why don't you, I've covered your background a little bit, but, uh, but why don't you tell folks a little bit about what the Briscoe Center at the University of Texas is um, and so that the people that may not know it the way I do and others do will uh, have a feel for that. Well, you know, uh, Kirk, our mission is to gather collections, uh, both uh, orig really original uh, research resources, uh, archives, uh, manuscript collections, uh, also newspaper collections, photographs, uh, anything that uh, illuminates and sheds light on, uh, on American history. Uh, and that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a history center. It's not a library. We do have a library. We have a rare book library. And uh, we also have one of the largest archives and manuscript collections on any university campus. If you took all the papers, all the original papers we have, uh, stood them on edge, they'd stretch 18 miles uh, in length. And 
our photograph collections are among the largest as well. We have uh, around 8 million photographs. So, uh, but our, our whole mission is to provide this material uh, for uh, anyone studying uh, U.S. history. And we, you know, we specialize in, in, in uh, certain topics, particularly, of course, Texas history, but also Southern history, uh, news media history, political history, congressional history, so on. Um, and uh, we're open to the public and we're in Sid Richardson Hall. The main facility is in Sid Richardson Hall next to the LBJ Library. And we also run three museums, uh, which are remote from Austin. And one of them is the Sam Rayburn Museum in Bonham, Texas. Another is the Briscoe uh, uh, Garner Museum in Uvalde. And then we also operate Wyndale, uh, which is near Round Top between, here, between Austin and Houston. Uh, and we, we also, we produce our own research projects as well. And so, as you've already mentioned, we produce uh, documentary films, we publish books, uh, we do exhibits. We have a 4,000 square foot exhibit uh, gallery. Uh, and I, I like to say, we're just a full service history center. Sounds like you are. Now, right now with COVID, um, COVID-19 and, and the shutdown that, some, that we're experiencing, uh, how are you? How are you functioning under those circumstances? Well, unfortunately, we're closed. We've been closed since March the twelfth, uh, but we have staff going in. Although we're closed to the public, we do have a, a skeletal staff that goes in, and uh, we're we're doing. We've really upgraded our uh, reference services uh, so that when our online reference services, so that we can still try to provide as much material uh, as we can from our collections. We have staff who will scan materials and send them to people who need them. Uh, and then we also already have uh, a large presence online of materials that were scanned over the years. So we have a body of material that you can you know, still reference, but uh, you, you can't go in right now and actually use our collections in person. And we're eager to get that started again. Yeah, I bet you are. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful facility and, and I, I bet you are. Let's let's talk a little bit about this book. Um, it's a it's a it's a dual biography, um, as you said. And, and as I understand it, you're working on the second volume, uh, not of one related to Will Hobby and Ovita Kopavi, but there's going to be a second volume that you're currently writing. Is that right? Uh, that's right. We're uh, and I'm writing a, a, a biography of Bill Hobby. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, William P. Hobby the, Jr. Uh, and uh, except on this book, I've got a co-author, uh, my colleague, Erin Purdy. And we're, going to, we're, we're going to see her and hear from her in just a second, too. Um, but let's let's talk about the, 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 the first of the, the dual biography, which is the first volume of uh, your, your hobby family uh, work. Um, tell us a little bit about Will and Ovita Cope Hobby and, and, and why do you think uh, they were worthy of a dual biography that goes in that, that's of this scope and goes into this level of detail. Well, you know, uh, well, let me start with the second part of your question, okay. uh, Kirk, uh, about why a dual uh, biography. Uh, when I began my work, I was was really very surprised uh, when I realized that very little has been published about either one of them, either Will or Ovita. Uh, a, a biography of Will came out in 1958, but it was very incomplete and it, it really lacked substance. Uh, it was really biography light, I guess is a good way to put it. Uh, a short biography of Ovita uh, was published a few years ago, but it, it was intended uh, for a youth audience. And it's more like an extended Wikipedia article. So neither book pays much attention to, uh, to the spouse. Uh, you know, in Will's biography, Ovita is pretty much left out. Uh, and Ovita's biography, Will's pretty much left out. Uh, they make cameo appearances. Um, so, you know, that complete, they, they, both books completely miss the importance of Will and Ovita uh, performing as the hobby team, which is what they they, they, a lot of people refer to them as the hobby team, and they also refer to themselves as the hobby team. So as I did my background reading, I, I began to see that uh, to understand either person, uh, one has to understand that partnership. So I decided that the only way to fully explain, to explain their lives 
was to write a book that linked and integrated their stories, uh, hence a dual biography, right. uh, one that would be comprehensive uh, and fill in the gaps, which are considerable in our knowledge about two significant historical figures who uh, really were real partners in all matters during their 33 years of marriage. Well, so tell us, a little bit, yeah. tell us a little bit about those two. Yeah, so, you know, this first part of your question is who were uh, Will and Ovita Hobby, and, and we obviously don't have time uh, to tell their life stories uh, because they span more than a century. Yeah. Uh, and after all, it took me 700 pages to do that. So my, my overview is going to be very uh, relatively brief. Uh, but let me start. Will Hobby uh, was born in East Texas in, in 1878. Uh, and after his family moved to Houston, uh, Will dropped out of, uh, out of high school uh, he, to work at the Houston Post in 1895. Uh, and then after making a name for himself as a reporter and an editor at the Houston Post, uh, uh, Will was lured to Beaumont. He was recruited by Citizens of Beaumont in 1907 uh, to serve as the editor and publisher of the Beaumont Enterprise. And then in 1914, seven years later, after he gained a, a statewide attention uh, as the editor of the newspaper because of his skillful use of the Beaumont Enterprise to gain support for making Beaumont a deep water port. He was very much involved in, in uh, that uh, effort, the successful effort. Uh, and he was the elected lieutenant governor of Texas in that year, 1914. He was a candidate for office for the first time. And while, uh, while he was lieutenant governor, he married a childhood sweetheart. Uh, her name was Willie Cooper. Uh, she was the daughter of a, of a Texas congressman, uh, actually a pretty important Texas congressman. Uh, and then when the legislature, and this is a whole different story, we can't get into any of these, actually. Um, That's why you need to read the book. Yeah, when the, <laughs> when the legislature impeached Governor James Paul Ferguson in 1917, uh, Will became governor, and he served until 1921. He won an election in 1918 and served a, a regular two-year term, and he, were, he served most of Ferguson's uh, unexpired term. And then when Will left office on his own accord, he wasn't defeated. He was persuaded uh, by Ross Sterling, an old family friend uh, uh, who was uh, himself a future Texas governor and one of the founders of the Humble Oil Company, uh, who had just purchased the Houston Post. And uh, Sterling asked him to be the paper's managing editor. So uh, Will and his wife uh, moved to Houston uh, and then in 1929, uh, Will's wife, uh, Willie, uh, died of a cerebral hemorrhage uh, in her sleep in 19, you know, as I say, in 1929, suddenly it was a terrific blow to, to Will. Two years later, uh, Will married Ovita Culp, a 24-year-old from Colleen, uh, who was 27 years younger than Will. And by the time of their marriage, um, Ovita had already become well known in state political affairs. It's some, it was, he was an amazing young uh, over accomplisher, so to speak, overachiever. Uh, the daughter, of, she was the daughter uh, of a member of the Texas legislature, uh, and Ovita served as the as the twenty year old parliamentarian of the Texas House of Representatives. Uh, before she was even old enough to vote. So, and she ran unsuccessfully for the state legislature from, in a seat from Houston. Uh, and then she worked in several important political campaigns. Uh, so she was, she was already well known as a very young woman. So the hobby team, after they got married, the hobby team of uh, Will and Ovita uh, quickly forged uh, an intimate personal and, per, uh, and professional relationship that led to the ownership uh, of the Houston Post. They, they eventually purchased the Houston Post. Uh, and they also uh, purchased uh, Houston's pioneering radio station, uh, KPRC uh, Radio. Uh, Ovita first took her place really on the national stage. She, she was well known in Texas, but she wasn't well known nationally. 
But that changed um, uh, as she became the celebrated founding commander of the Women's Army Corps uh, during World War II. She was literally the first woman in the U.S. Army. And she worked closely with President Roosevelt, uh, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, and General George C. Marshall during four years uh, uh, in, the in the service. So uh, she did an incredible job. And in recognition of the outstanding performance that she performed as a, as a WAC commander, uh, the Army uh, awarded her the Distinguished Service Medal, uh, which is, and she was the first woman uh, to ever receive that medal. Um, and uh, it's, a, you know, it's a higher ranking medal. Her contributions to the war effort, in fact, were so significant uh, that she's the only woman uh, who's quoted on the World War II <laughs> Memorial on the National Mall in Washington. Uh, one of her quotes is chis chiseled in stone there. Uh, after the war, Oveda returned to Texas and reassumed uh, her position as editor of the Houston Post. And then in 1950, she and Will purchased the first television station in Houston. And they gave it the same call letters as their radio station. And that was K that's KPRC, uh, Channel 2. Uh, and, and then in 1952, Ovita played a decisive role in helping Dwight Eisenhower uh, win the, pre the presidential nomination uh, uh, for the Republicans. And she led the national organization, Democrats for Eisenhower. Uh, that helped I carry Texas uh, and other Southern states. And that was quite a job because uh, uh, the last Republican to carry Texas uh, had been Herbert Hoover in 1928. In 1953, President Eisenhower appointed Oveda as the secretary of the newly established Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, uh, known as HEW, uh, and thus becoming really only the second woman in U.S. history uh, to serve on a presidential cabinet. Frances Perkins, uh, Secretary of Labor in Roosevelt's administration was the first, but she was the second, Ovita was the second. Uh, she resigned in 1955 to return to Houston uh, because Will's uh, health was declining rapidly uh, at that time. And, and so she returned, to, she gave up her job and returned to Houston to take care of him. Uh, and Will was bedridden, sadly, for most of the years after Ovita left uh, Washington, left the HEW, and he died in 1964. Uh, the city of Houston uh, named its municipal airport in his honor, and of course, we all know uh, Hobby Airport. Um, now, during uh, Ovita didn't stop at that point. She still ran the Houston Post uh, for many years, and and during LBJ's presidency, she continued public service. I think it's very important to emphasize uh, when she really didn't need to, frankly. Uh, it was true, a true cause. And she, she accepted several appointments for service on uh, important task forces uh, by LBJ. L Lyndon Johnson appointed her. And, and, and one of the task forces that she joined uh, or agreed to, to be appointed to was one where she had to go to Vietnam uh, during the war. Uh, and another led to the creation, literally, of PBS and NPR. Uh, she sold the Houston Post in 1983. Uh, you know, we all are aware of where the newspaper business was going by that time. And then she sold KPRC TV in 1994. And then she died in 1995 at the age of 90. Now, among the accomplishments before we, you know, I give up the biography here, I want to add that Will and Ovita had two talented children, uh, Jessica and Bill, uh, who would become known for their own accomplishments because uh, Bill, who served uh, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor of Texas uh, uh, longer than anyone else in Texas history, uh, and was, uh, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of many, many people, uh, the very best lieutenant governor uh, the state has ever had. And an interesting, one last interesting footnote I want to mention, uh, Bill and Jessica uh, share the same birthday, January the 19th, with their mother. All three of them Something, were yeah. born on the same day. I only recently learned, well, I, I, from you, I think, uh, that that's a fascinating fact. Um, 
Well, that, that's a great uh, explanation of that. Let's, uh, let's take a second. I understand we've got a couple of pictures and Aaron is going to help us with that. And Aaron, while you're putting those pictures up so that uh, Don can uh, describe what's in there, let me introduce you to the group. Uh, Aaron is the director of communications. Aaron Purdy is, is with us. She's the director of communications for the Briscoe Center and has served as one of the editors for this book, The Governor and the Colonel. And she's the co-author of the center's upcoming biography that Don's uh, working on that we've already talked about, uh, the biography of Lieutenant Governor Bill Hobby. Um, so uh, thank you for bringing these pictures and let's, let's talk about them a little bit. Well, that's uh, obviously to cover. And then we go to, uh, this is a great picture. This is uh, the young Ovita uh, in the Texas House uh, and performing her parliamentarian duties uh, and with the Speaker of the House. Uh, you, you'll recognize that uh, setting, uh, uh, Kirk. Absolutely. Uh, this is a great picture. Uh, this is, she's being sworn in as a Colonel uh, in the Women's Army Corps. And she, um, she is accompanied uh, by the great, you know, the great uh, historical figure, uh, George, uh, General George C. Marshall, uh, just to, uh, this would be to her right, would be our left, and General Somerville, who is the person who built the Pentagon, uh, is right behind her there. Uh, that's an adjutant uh, judge who uh, is swearing her in. Uh, okay, and then we have, uh, this is the this is the quote I was talking about when I said that she's the only woman quoted on the World War II memorial on the on the mall. Uh, those of you who have been up to D.C. On, uh, before COVID and uh, have seen the World War II memorial, uh, she, this is her talking about uh, really about the wax. Okay, all right. I love this picture too. This this is in the in the Oval Office uh, in the White House. And uh, you can see kind of a mischievous uh, look on uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower's face uh, because uh, uh, what he's done, she, uh, Ovita on the left is uh, obviously has been just sworn in as secretary of HEW. And uh, Will was up there for the ceremony, of course. And Will was not the most outgoing person in the world. And uh, he uh, was kind of, you know, sort of out, out of the way and hiding. And uh, President Eisenhower knew Will well, uh, and he made sure he grabbed Will and pulled him over and made sure he was in the pictures that they were taking of them uh, together. And you can see the look on Eisenhower's face there. That's great. Okay. All right. And that's, uh, this is Will signing the, uh, the, the bill uh, to uh, let women uh, vote in uh, the party primaries in Texas. Well, that, that was the next thing. I, I, that's where I was going to ask you right after we finished the picture. So let's just pause a second, if you don't mind. Um, and, and and let me ask you about that. Do, and we have other, do we have other pictures? Just have a couple more. Well, let's actually. just go through the pictures and I'll come back to that. I apologize. But I got ahead. That's okay. That's all right. That's fine. I, let's go to the other pictures. Did everybody remember this picture? Okay, this is, uh, I put this in here because uh, even though Will was not, was sort of the uh, uh, anti-political candidate, or was sort of the antithesis of the normal political candidates, uh, he was actually very, he surprised everyone when he ran for Lieutenant Governor, Governor, turned out to be a very effective campaigner and, and took to it pretty easily. This is him in Van Horn, uh, Texas, and he was at the, the they had a Pioneer Days uh, festival every year, and he, <laughs> He's uh, he got dressed up in uh, cowboy garb, and he's he, he's actually a horseman, by the way. This isn't some sort of you know post photograph where he had to stand on a stool and they had to you know prop him up. He he was quite a horseman, uh, but I love the photograph, and uh, this is why he's governor. Well, you know during the time he was governor. Okay, and you know uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. But uh, when o, when Oviedo was secretary of health, education, and welfare. Uh, she uh, oversaw the program uh, to develop uh, the, the polio vaccine. Uh, and uh, this is a photograph. She was, as secretary of HEW, uh, she also was a promoter uh, of the March of Dimes, uh, uh, which raised money uh, for polio research. And this is a, a publicity photograph that uh, they took for that fundraising drive, okay? 
And this is uh, Ovita and uh, the gentleman in the middle is uh, General George C. Marshall's personal pilot. Uh, and behind them is George C. Marshall's uh, uh, own airplane, is their army airplane that he loaned to Ovita to carry Eleanor Roosevelt to uh, Iowa to the Women's Army Corps uh, training camp. And this is in the snow, obviously, of Iowa. I, I think that's a great picture, too. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, and this is one of my favorites, of course. Uh, this is Will Hobby, with, uh, the proud father of a young Bill Hobby. Uh, and as you'll note, uh, Bill took after his uh, father in wearing the cowboy garb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a great picture. Anything? OK, I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a great. That, that's that. Thanks for doing that. And Aaron, thank you for helping us with that. That's that's tremendous. Well, Don, let's go back because, like I said, one of the things that I wanted to yeah. ask you about, yeah. you know, um, and you, you, you showed the picture of him as governor, uh, Will Hobby, signing uh, the bill that, that related to, a lot, that, that let women in Texas vote. So In the party primaries. The yeah. Party primary. That's right. Yeah. That's, an important, that's an important distinction. Um, and Governor Hobby was, was, I guess, the first governor in the South to push for ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, talk a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit well, about that, particularly as we celebrate know, Women's History Month. Yeah, well, well, well Kirk, uh, Will supported women's suffrage, uh, uh, you know, long before, any, before he was governor. He, did edit, he, he printed editorials in the Beaumont Enterprise uh, in favor of women's suffrage. So it's fairly early uh, in, in that story. Uh, and he, he supported women's suffrage, even when his very conservative political allies, particularly in Houston, uh, opposed women's suffrage. Uh, John Henry Kirby was one who opposed, and John Henry Kirby was one of his very close allies. Uh, but, but Will was greatly, you know, he was greatly influenced by uh, the views of his first wife, Willie, uh, who was actually a very a, a vigorous advocate for suffrage. Uh, but when Will, you'll, you'll enjoy this, when Will ran for lieutenant governor in 1914, he saw the suffrage issue as a politically dangerous distraction uh, that he preferred to avoid, even though he supported it, he uh, decided to avoid it in his election campaign. Uh, so he made a strategic decision to ignore the suffrage issue. Uh, in his view, the suffrage issue would be resolved one way or the other on its own without his involvement. So why get involved, make it a, can, a campaign issue? Um, so, uh, but because his, his uh, well, anyway, but the political, you know, the political equation actually uh, for women's suffrage um, had then changed by the time Will ran for governor uh, on his own in 1918, four years later, changed tremendously quickly. And his opponent, uh, was the impeached uh, James Ferguson, who was a rabid opponent of women's suffrage. And Ferguson gave speeches uh, on the trail. He was quite the orator, okay? He was a very demagogic uh, type character. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he gave speeches he, he loved to say, that declaring that the suffragettes, uh, quote, uh, the quote was that would rather nurse a poodle dog than a baby and that they were a class of women who would rather raise trouble than to raise a family. And uh, so we don't have time to get into the details, but Minnie Fisher Cunningham, uh, who was the leader of the uh, women's suffrage movement in Texas made a deal with Hobby, a political deal with Hobby. They, they abho she abhorred Ferguson, obviously, uh, she and the suffragettes did. Uh, but she made a deal with Hobby, who was afraid that the that uh, Ferguson was still popular enough to defeat him. So Minnie Fisher Cunningham told Will that uh, if he would support a law to allow women to vote in the state party primaries, uh, which was the only election that mattered in Texas in those days because of the dominance of uh, the Democratic Party, the general election you know didn't really matter much. Uh, so she and her allies uh, that she told Will that she and her allies would make certain that Will would receive the women's vote. If they could vote, that would be the deal. You support us and we'll vote for you. Uh, so Will agreed uh, and Cunningham, uh, Minnie Fisher Cunningham uh, and her suffrage movement uh, kept their promise. 
and he received the vast majority of the women's vote, and he soundly defeated Ferguson. And during his second term in office in 1919, Will not only successfully uh, lobbied the Texas legislature to ratify the 19th Amendment to the federal constitution, he also traveled to Oklahoma and Tennessee uh, to urge the legislatures of those states to ratify the, the you know, to ratify the amendment. And then when uh, in Tennessee uh, ratified the 19th Amendment in August of 1919, August, yeah, of 1919, and it finally became law, but uh, Will worked hard uh, to get that uh, bill passed in Tennessee. He went to, he went to Nashville, and he went to Tennessee, and he campaigned for it. You know, the, the first time I ever heard that uh, Governor Will Hobby uh, did some of that um, and was, was instrumental in, in women getting the right to vote in Texas, um, was from a, a really dear friend of Lieutenant Governor uh, Bill Hobbies, and that is the current Secretary of the Senate, the Texas Senate, Patsy Spa. Mm -hmm. um, while I was in the Senate, it, when she talks about uh, the history of the Senate and the history of women in the Senate and women voting uh, as part of Texas Women's History Month or as Women's History Month or just Texas Women in the Senate, that is one of the, the things that she always brings up is that very significant historical fact. L let's uh, talk a little bit. You, you, during the, 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 the summary of their, their lives um, and some of those pictures, uh, Oviedo obviously was full of firsts. Um, you, know, uh, you mentioned the first woman to officially be in the U.S. Army. Uh, she was the first secretary of uh, health, education, and welfare, the second woman in a cabinet position, uh, and, and many, many more. Um, you know, even in 2021, we know that women continue to struggle with issues of gender equity and equality. Talk a little bit about the challenges for Ovita to be that person that was having so many firsts. Uh, sure. I, well, you know, as command. As commander of the Women's Army Corps, you'll not be shocked to know that uh, she was frequently forced to deal uh, with sexist behavior uh, by, guess what, male members of Congress, uh, her fellow military officers, and her fellow journalists of all people. Well, maybe I shouldn't say of all people, but anyway, from her fellow journalists. Uh, and even her army rank, Kirk, was dictated by sexism. Uh, uh, although the size of her command uh, qualified her to be a general officer, uh, the Southern delegation in Congress refused to allow Ovita to have a higher rank than Colonel, uh, strictly because she was a woman. Uh, I mean, that was the only reason, okay? She qualified to be a general. Uh, when she testified in Congress to, in, in support of creating the Women's Army Corps, I mean, she helped create it as well. She helped get the law passed that actually, you know, authorized the Women's Army Corps. Ovita had to put, put up with some real, some real, real Neanderthals. Uh, one of them was, uh, was uh, South Carolina Senator Cotton Ed Smith. Uh, and Cotton Ed uh, complained uh, in a hearing with her. Uh, he told her that the creation of the Women's Army Corps uh, would be a deplorable step, eventually leading to the downfall of the entire nation. Uh, and he charged that uh, it would result in disrespect uh, for womanhood uh, because of, and I, this is sort of, I think this is a, pretty much a, a, a correct quote, something like, you know, uh, she, he said, all this nonsense that we hear about buying girdles and brassieres and things for these women soldiers uh, that they're going to wear, uh, that's going to cause us all to, to lose our modesty. Uh, so <laughs> this is the kind of thing that she had to put up with. Uh, and at one point, the Army decided to grant honorable discharges to married wax if they became pregnant while they were in the Corps. Unmarried women, however, would be dishonorably discharged uh, for the previously unknown offense of pregnancy without permission. Oh Ovita hit the roof in anger. Uh, she was not a woman to make mad, okay? 
and a very contentious meeting with Army Brass, uh, she argued that the regulation was not only unfair, it was also legally untenable. She had taken some law school courses. Uh, she didn't graduate, but she had taken some law school. So obviously, she said, there is no such thing as an illegal pregnancy, either in military or civilian law. And uh, so she asked the brass, the, the officers, uh, if male sol soldiers uh, who fathered children with women who were not their wives uh, would also be subject to the regulation. Uh, the army made a hasty retreat. Bugles were played, and that was the end of the uh, story. So you didn't brook, uh, you didn't brook uh, uh, Ovita. And throughout her tenure, really in the in the army, this is this will not surprise anyone. She she was you know, but uh, the news media often stressed that Ovita's you know they often stressed Ovita's attractive physical appearance, uh, and sometimes though to an absurd extent. Uh, at one point, the Associated Press asked one of its photographers uh, to take a picture of Colonel Hobby uh, in a swimsuit standing on the diving board of the swimming pool at the WAC officer training camp in Iowa. An Army press officer <laughs> vetoed the, that idea rather firmly uh, with the explanation that there would be no cheesecake of the boss. Oh As secretary of HEW, she was the frequent target of male newspaper columnists, with some liberal columnists claiming that she lacked the nurturing uh, and compassionate traits associated with femininity, while conservatives, on the other hand, uh, conservative newspaper writers for the Hearst Corporation particularly, uh, sorry, Houston Chronicle, uh, they complained, the conservatives complained, that she was too soft-hearted and liberal just because she was a woman. Uh, even some of her uh, right-wing conservative fellow members on the cabinet, uh, such as Agricultural uh, Secretary Ezra Taft Benson uh, uh, from Utah, uh, worried that as a woman, uh, Ovita secretly harbored liberal inclinations and that her actions as uh, at HEW had to be monitored carefully. Uh, at least uh, she imposed socialized medicine on the country while no one was watching. Yeah, no one paying attention. Oh my goodness, isn't that amazing? Um, no, it's 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 part of our history. So, um, well, thanks for sharing that. Let, let let me tell everybody if you've got a question. Go to the Q&A on your computer because um, uh, Don's happy to answer some specific questions uh, from our viewers if, if any of you have questions. But, but Don, I want to I switch gears. You know, we're, here we are doing this by Zoom. Um, as, as you know, and, I'll, and others uh, that are close to this know, uh, my whole hope had been that I would have you on campus and uh, we'd have a, a big, nice event and, and a reception. But COVID, a pandemic, kept us from doing that. So, but but this isn't our first pandemic, and uh, the country's first pandemic, no. uh, and and the Spanish flu pandemic had an impact um, on um, Governor Will Hobby's tenure as governor. Talk a little bit about that uh, and the impact well, it had on him. Yeah, the Spanish, the so-called Spanish flu. Right. Uh, it affected him greatly, Kirk. Um, Will and his wife, Willie, his first wife, Willie, uh, were in Washington, D.C., uh, meeting with President Woodrow Wilson and members of the Wilson administration in October of 1918. Uh, when uh, they received the news that uh, the deadly influenza pandemic of that time uh, uh, that was killing millions of people, uh, that it had worsened in the northeastern states where they were. Uh, or, you know, Washington's not in the Northeast, but in the Northeast. Uh, so they cut their stay, it scared them. And so they cut their stay in Washington short uh, to come back to Texas uh, in an attempt to, to escape the outbreak. Uh, only to learn uh, when they arrived here in Austin uh, that influenza had spread to the state and the situation really was quite dire. 
Uh, one source at the time uh, estimated that about 9,000 men stationed at, at military bases in Texas died of the flu that month. And Austin, 10 to 15 people were dying from the flu every single day. Uh, those numbers don't sound, it's amazing. Those numbers don't sound so uh, huge uh, uh, because of what we've been going through. But let me tell you, the population was much smaller uh, then. And the percentages were, you know, uh, pretty high. Um, so the situation was so bad that the state issued a proclamation uh, urging, um, actually, you know, urging but not mandating uh, the temporary closure of all places uh, uh, of assembly in the state, uh, especially theaters and churches and schools. Uh, so soon after uh, Will returned from Washington, he was hit by the flu and he was very ill for several weeks and his recovery uh, was excruciatingly slow and he was bedridden and miserable for the entire month of November, really. And at the end of that month, at the end of November, uh, Willie was so worried about him that uh, she persuaded him to flee Austin and to go back with her to Beaumont until he returned to full strength. His illness, by the way, was severe enough uh, to spark widespread rumors in the state uh, that uh, he was going to resign from office wow. uh, or even that he was close to death or even that he was dead uh, because he went because he was in Beaumont and not in Austin. So but Will uh, obviously uh, fully recover, uh, recuperated, uh, I think it was in late December. Uh, but when he returned to Austin after Christmas, he canceled uh, the traditional New Year's uh, day reception at the governor's mansion. And with the epidemic still raging, uh, people were avoiding uh, large social gatherings. And uh, the governor's traditional inaugural ball, which was originally, was originally scheduled for January the 21st, uh, the, uh, was postponed uh, because of the, the, the pandemic until March the 3rd, uh, because of the fear of having uh, large, you know, large gatherings. And but by March, the epidemic had faded enough that the, they that they did have the ball, the ball, and uh, people could return uh, finally return to regular business. Well, um, you know, we're talking about vaccines, and you know, a minute ago, you uh, with what we're all going through, and everybody wants to get a vaccine, and we hope that gets us back to normal in our time. But you, in that picture that you, one of the pictures you had of Ovita Culp hobby, um, you mentioned the salt vaccine. Right. Talk a little bit about what she went through in her official role in the distribution of that vaccine. Well, you know, our current problem with COVID vaccine supply and distribution is, is nothing new, by the way. Um, we had a very similar controversy in 1955 during the battle against polio. Uh, the, the controversy itself centered on what role the federal government should play in the national distribution of SOC vaccine. Does this sound... Yeah, yeah. As HEW Secretary, uh, Ovita uh, was deeply involved in that controversy because uh, she had the legal responsibility uh, uh, really for certifying the safety uh, and the, the effectiveness of the vaccines and uh, for ensuring really that it be distributed fairly. But there was no uh, codification of how uh, or, or direction, how she was supposed to distribute the vaccine. Uh, so it was an open question. And, and, and so, she, but she believed personally uh, that the vaccination pr uh, program should be left to the private sector and to the states uh, to work out. Uh, and that pulled her into a heated and emotional controversy uh, that was caught up in the country's never ending fear of socialized medicine. Uh, Democrats accused Ovita of heartlessness and cruelty uh, because of the chaos resulting from leaving distribution up to the states. It was by far the most trying and difficult public policy issue that she faced in her long career. And it's really a complex story that, that took ch two chapters in my book to cover. Yeah. Uh, but I'll just, I'll just point out that that's another example of a problem that Ovita faced that is deep you know, relevance today. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. 
Um, let me ask a couple in, in our last 15 minutes. I, what I want to do is ask a couple of questions we've got from um, the audience. And then I, I want to ask a, a closing question. Um, one of the questions is what's the, what are the primary source materials for your, uh, the books in the Briscoe Center is the way this, this question was asked. Well, we have, uh, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Governor Bill, uh, Bill Hobby, we have Governor Will Hobby's uh, papers at the uh, center, his, his personal papers and family papers and some official papers. But uh, uh, we have, you know, the, the official papers or uh, the governor's papers are in the state, uh, state archives. Uh, but we have a wonderful collection of uh, materials uh, of uh, documenting Will's uh, life in the Briscoe Center. And then we have the papers of people like Oscar Colquitt, governor, former Governor Colquitt, and other people, many people who played very key roles, uh, like uh, Will, Will Hogg is another one, uh, uh, in, in uh, Will's life. Uh, so we have a lot of resources there, and I'm missing a lot of them. I mean, I'm not mentioning all of them. We have James Ferguson's papers, for example. Wow. Um, another question from the audience is, were Ovita Culp Hobby and many Fisher Cunningham acquaintances? And then this person points out, many was, I suspect, to the left of Ovita, uh, but might be very wrong. Well, now, Ovita's political worldview at that time, and we're talking, you got to understand that Ovita was only uh, 13 years old, um, you know, it was only 14 when the uh, suffrage amendment was passed. And uh, so she was a little young to know, you know, really know Minnie Fisher Cunningham very well. Uh, she got around a great deal uh, as a teenager in Austin. She was uh, living in Austin. Uh, she'd come to, uh, and to the legislature with her father so she met a lot of people. I mean, she dated uh, future governor Jimmy Allred, for example, uh, when she was uh, uh, a young woman. And uh, also, uh, oh, the mayor, uh, I mean, a former congressman from Waco, uh, 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 Pogue. Yeah. Dated him. Bob, Pogue. Bob Pogue. Yeah. So I don't know. You know, I don't have, I, if they knew each other, uh, it really doesn't surface or bubble up much in uh, either one of them's story. Now, you know, many Fisher Cunningham obviously knew Will Hobby sure. uh, very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next question from the audience is, there's been some discussion uh, of President Eisenhower trying to persuade uh, Ovita Culp Hobby to consider running for the presidency after his term was over. And you mentioned that in the book. Uh, right. How seriously did she consider that? She didn't consider it very seriously, um, but uh, we have all the evidence points that uh, Eisenhower was serious. Uh, he was desperately looking for somebody else to run for president uh, than instead of Richard Nixon, his own vice president. Mm -hmm. And he was also, uh, he was trying to uh, talk Robert Anderson, who was Secretary of the Treasury and was a Texas oil man. Uh, he was a, quite an important person in, in Washington in the, in the uh, Eisenhower administration. And uh, he was a Texan. And Eisenhower liked Texans. Uh, and he was really after Bob Anderson to, to stand up and go against Nixon uh, uh, for the nomination. When, when that didn't happen, he, he asked Ovita to. Uh, it's a really kind of amazing thing if you think about it. Really uh, but she didn't, she even, um, you know, the, she had a letter from him uh, as, asking if she would consider running and she had that locked up in her safe. She's that that uh, she even wrote on the letter, you know, placed in safe. She because she knew uh, how damaging if that letter or that information got out to Richard Nixon, uh, yeah. you know. And uh, you know, of course, Eisenhower finally came around and supported uh, Nixon to replace him. I kind of didn't do it. <laughs> Wasn't real hardy about it, but anyway, yeah, that's true. That's that's. Um, the next question on here was. Um, can you explain the power of the 8F group on Texas politics? Yeah, uh, you know, the big urban centers uh, uh, in the United States either were run by, uh, many of them were either run by bosses, uh, strong mayors, uh, you know, urban bosses uh, uh, or, or machines, you know, like, uh, you, know, Tam, uh, oh, you know, Tammany Hall in New right. York. 
uh, our urban bosses. Um, but all some cities were, were run really by businessmen's clique, uh, cliques. Um, and uh, that's what ADOF, the ADOF, ADOF crowd was in Houston. Uh, it was a group of, it was an informal group. It wasn't, you know, membership or something like that. It was an informal group uh, that, they, that they socialized with each other. Uh, and uh, they, they did it in uh, Jesse Jones's hotel. They had a suite in Jesse Jones's hotel and it was the 8F suite. Uh, it was the suite that George and Herman Brown of Brown and Root, the founders of Brown and Root, uh, rented, leased from Jesse Jones uh, because they did a lot of lobbying there, frankly. And uh, so, but anyway, uh, Will and Ovita were really, uh, they got pulled into that group and they were very close friends to all of the key members. Uh, Judge James Elkins is one, one good example, the founder of the Vincent Elkins Law Firm, and what used to be called the First City National Bank in Houston, and he was uh, the hobby's lawyer as well, uh, uh, James Elkins was. Jesse Jones, of course, uh, the publisher of the Houston Chronicle, uh, uh, was, was a member. Uh, all the powers, uh, Gus Wortham, a man named Gus Wortham, uh, some of these names won't mean a lot to some of the younger people, uh, but uh, uh, it was a powerful group, and they they had individual interests. Some of them were interested in school board races, uh, elections, mainly political. Um, James Elkins was very interested in the state legislature. He was, uh, you know, a very powerful figure there. So, uh, and she didn't really, you know, the main thing the was in terms of socializing. The main thing the the, the she was the only woman. In the group, and it's like, and that was nothing to her. She was the only woman in a lot of situations, as you could see. Uh, but she didn't attend the poker games and the bourbon drinking sessions, uh, which went on. But Will did. Will, Will, that was you know, Will loved that. So, so um, th this has been a great discussion, and, and you know, it's it's rooted in public policy and public service, and of course. Uh, as I started this, I, I talked about how we, we try to make proud uh, the hobby family, uh, being the Hobby School of Public Affairs. But as you've been working on, as you, you've completed this dual biography and you're working on uh, the second volume, I, I'd like to ask you as we close out tonight to just speak to the importance of public service in the hobby family. Oh, uh, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, some of the famous some of the other famous families in the United States, the Rockefellers, uh, Rockefeller brothers come to mind, for example, the Kennedys, so forth. I mean, it's almost like they were born to public service. Uh, it's come, it really came natural to them and they really grew up in, uh, with ancestors who were involved in public service. It's really been passed down through, uh, through generations. And you know, they, they uh, also established the Hobby Foundation uh, in terms of philanthropy, they've been active in that as well. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, just was, it's an incredibly important part of their story. Uh, the, um, you know, Bill Hobby didn't have to, to do service as a, as a lieutenant governor of Texas. I mean, uh, his activities were pure public service, in my opinion. Uh, and, you know, Ovita didn't have to do that either. Uh, they, she, uh, uh, after Will died, for example, you know, uh, she was a wealthy woman. Uh, she didn't have to go to Vietnam for Lyndon Johnson. Uh, she didn't have to commit to attend all these committee meetings uh, that led to NPR and PBS, but she believed in, in these things and, and she believed in public service. So there's a rich tradition uh, there. Yeah. Uh, uh, that they stand for. And it, I can't think of anything more appropriate than having a public, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, public policy school uh, named for uh, Bill Hobby. I mean, how appropriate that is, is, you know. Yeah, it's a, you can't get any better than that. You can't get any better than that as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I, I, like I say, we, we work hard to, to make the Hobby family and all of the Hobby family proud. Um, so the last question that I want to know is, is uh, tell us the, the timeline 
on the second volume, uh, the book that'll be about Lieutenant Governor Bill Hobby? Uh, well, <laughs> we have a deadline. The best you can under the circumstances. <laughs> we have a deadline, and uh, we have a we're way ahead, really, because uh, obviously, you know, when I was doing my research on uh, on his parents, uh, Bill becomes part of the story in 1932. Mm -hmm. born, on January the 19th. And uh, so, you know, I did all this research about Will's youth and uh, his life uh, really, uh, uh, you know, uh, up until he uh, runs for Lieutenant Governor uh, is integrated with, the, with his mom and, you know, his mother and father's story. So mm -hmm. I have all of that material uh, and we've already, you know, we're already started, uh, you know, outlining chapters and we're doing some oral histories. Erin is an accomplished oral historian and uh, she's been doing the oral histories uh, for this. And uh, so I'm, anyway, to answer your question more directly, um, our deadline is uh, September uh, of this year to have a manuscript finished. Uh, and then the way these things work, uh, it'll probably, it would be September. Uh, it takes about a year of copy editing, book design, all the various things that have to be done, uh, you know, and then manufacturing the printing of it. Anyway, we're looking at September 1st of next year, uh, 22, uh, to have the book out. Well, great. And, and I'm, I'm going to close the conversation by letting everybody know uh, the participants in, in tonight's um, event that you're gonna receive a follow-up email and it's gonna have a link on how you can purchase uh, this book, uh, this volume of, of the, the two-part series, um, if you're interested in doing that. And, and let me just tell you, if this didn't whet your appetite, uh, I don't know what would because uh, it, you ought to be interested. It's a great book. So Don, thank you uh, for doing this. Uh, I wanna also say thank you again to the University of Houston Center for Public History and thank you to the Hobby family um, everybody stay safe and, um, wear your mask. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Kirk. I, I really appreciate the invitation and okay. it's been very enjoyable. Thank and let me also know. say, if you, if anyone buys a book, uh, the, the, the money goes to the Briscoe center, uh, uh, support our programs. Everybody stay safe, happy, and healthy. God bless y'all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um,